Our next speaker is uh, Bindu Rani, and we'll talk about extreme flaring activity and that uh, named source over there. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so actually I will uh, talk about a couple of things which I have seen uh, in uh, this uh, object, which is the BLX uh, object. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the things which I observed for this source um, actually um, make me to realize or at least think that uh, it could be that uh, the B fast BLX which we see uh, can actually be quasars for which uh, the broad emission lines has been swamped by the non-thermal uh, optical continuum. And uh, I will talk about uh, these results uh, in, a, in my next slide. So, so let me tell you a bit about this source. Uh, it's a BLX object and uh, it has a redshift of around 0 0.3. But uh, just to let you know that uh, this, uh, um, we have a constraint on the redshift of the source. It's not that we actually know the redshift of the source because uh, uh, so far no, uh, no emission line has been detected in the source. So I would call it a, a, the source with a featureless so optical spectrum or I would call it a, a gas uh, poor BLX objects. And uh, of course, since I do VLBI, I, I would definitely in any of my presenter presentation would like to show one of this uh, imaging, one of these uh, nice images which we obtained uh, with the GMVA observations. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, um, there is a mo one uh, recent and important and exciting uh, results uh, which has been reported for th uh, this source was uh, a high highly polarized uh, microflare, which has been recently reported uh, uh, in the source. And I certainly encourage you to look out uh, uh, at Gopal's poster uh, and <laughs> for the details uh, on this flare. So um, first thing which uh, I, I actually realized that uh, this source could uh, be, uh, the properties of this source are very much similar to the properties of flat spectrum or, property of quasars actually is because of the the breaks spectral breaks which we observe in the source and it's not only in this source that we saw, saw this uh, spectral breaks uh, uh, but it's also like if you consider the, all of these low synchrotron peak uh, BLX objects uh, where if you compare the um, the spectral breaks uh, of those objects with the FSRQs in the GV spectrum you don't see a difference if you just look at the gamma ray spectrum you cannot tell which is which uh, so um, for example, here you see the observed uh, spectrum, uh, high energy spectrum of the source uh, for an energy range between 100 MeV to 300 GeV. And as you can see, the red point, which is uh, uh, a model with simple power law, cannot explain the spectrum of the source. Uh, and certainly we need a, a broken power law or a second, um, a more complicated model. Here I just show the broken power law. And uh, we see a prominent break around 3.5 GeV in this source. Uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, of course, uh, um, the, the origin of these spectral breaks uh, is still an open question and there are um, many proposed scenarios, but we don't have a clear understanding uh, why, do we do, why do we see spectral breaks in these objects. And uh, in addition to that, there is one important point is that uh, uh, since uh, the spectral breaks uh, are not constant, they vary by a factor of around, uh, they vary between 0 0.4 to 1.4. One for for this source and other sources as well. In addition to that, what have we have seen that the break energy uh, is uh, if you plot that as a function of uh, brightness uh, in the source uh, for different flares, uh, it uh, it doesn't correlate uh, well with the flux. Um, so this uh, this tells us that uh, the uh, the spectral breaks which we have observed uh, they are probably not due to the radiative cooling, uh, um, and if unless there is a second, uh, uh, some complicated uh, processes which are involved in that and that uh, makes us to observe these features, uh, makes us uh, um, to observe uh, uh, this kind of behavior. Another thing is that uh, if I try to model the spectrum of the source, like the broadband SED of the source, uh, if I, if I try to observe, if I observe the source and if I model with a, a simple synchrotron self-compton mechanism, in, in the Python stage, it's easy for me to fit the high energy spectrum of the source uh, with the synchrotron self-compton model. However, however, if I take uh, the flaring state of the source, uh, you can see here the, uh, the dotted uh, curve in magenta, which is just due to synchrotron self-compton mechanism. Uh, the synchrotron self-compton mechanism cannot explain uh, the observed high energy spectrum of the source. Uh, so we need a definitely a second model. And the second model could be you add one synchrotron component. That could be one choice. 
otherwise you can uh, try to look for the external component contribution in the source uh, and if we do that uh, we find that uh, we need an external component field uh, with an energy of order of um, 10 to the power minus 6 arcs per centimeter cube i would like to compare this value with the, the typical external uh, uh, field energy which we see for quasars uh, so i when i do that i find that uh, this uh, external field uh, uh, radiation energy density is a factor of uh, 1000 lower as compared to quasars uh, and this could be one of the reasons uh, that uh, we, we could think that uh, there e are some thermal photons but since uh, first of all uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the jet emission is so pronounced that we don't see these features uh, and the second thing is that uh, these uh, thermal, uh, the thermal, uh, um, uh, thermal contribution is so weak that uh, we, we, we are not able to detect it. Another thing is that uh, the, the, the valley like structures which we see for these blazars um, or be a lack of objects uh, in the if we combine the GEV TV spectrum of the source. Uh, so here is the Fermi data and here are the TV observations with magic uh, and uh, um, the, the the blue line blue curve here you uh, see is uh, due to if you if you consider that there is a BLR and if you imagine that the BLR is observing the uh, is um, uh, is uh, is going to absorb some of the photons then you can expect this kind of valley like structure but complete uh, broad line absorption if you take the whole BLR you cannot uh, explain uh, uh, the, the the feature which you see in the source uh, and then we get, uh, go if you go to the next model where you consider the hydrogen and helium absorption probably you, you could fit uh, the valley like uh, feature observed in the source um, uh, and the next thing is that the apparent motion the apparent motions which we have observed in these sources uh, not only in this source well this is an extreme case uh, but also in other source if you take a look at the Mojave paper and if you compare the speeds which we see for BLX uh, and flat spectrum radio quasars uh, there are many of the sources where the apparent speeds are comparable to um, comparable in BLX and FSRQs. Here we have the extreme case. The extreme case is that in radial directions we observe uh, speeds as high as um, 37C using the 43 gigahertz VLBI data. In addition to that I check uh, if you take a look at the Mojave paper Lister et al 2003 you there this is the source uh, reported with the maximum uh, apparent speed which was of four of around 43. And this speed, the, the sp this speed value is even high for 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 a extreme quasar. And because of these things, um, I was too fast. Anyway, so because of these properties, uh, it's not only one candidate where we see this extreme behavior. There are plenty of other sources where the speeds are comparable in BLF objects and FSRQs. The spectral breaks are also similar, despite of the fact that uh, in FSRQs we have the richer BLR uh, broadline region, and in BLX. Uh, we believe that this may not be the case and similar apparent speeds and there are some BLX objects where the apparent speeds are uh, much much higher compared to FSRQs and that brings uh, me to this question is it possible that the fast BLX objects are actually quasars and I end there. <laughs> Yeah, we have plenty of time for questions. So, yeah, um, I I think this is a very interesting idea because, in fact, historically, this was one of the first suggestions to explain what are BLX -like objects in general. That maybe they were just quasars that were oriented with the jets very, 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 very close to the line of sight, and then it was shown that there were actually systematic differences between them, and so that this couldn't explain them, but. Uh, this is the first time I've heard it suggested that a, a subset of the BLX could be actually um, have their, their emission, li uh, emission lines blocked by beaming of the continuum. So I, th I think this is worth exploring. So um, I have a couple of uh, issues. Uh... Can you raise your hand? Oh, oh yeah, this one, hi. <laughs> So um, one is that you, you know you are talking about BLR as as the external source of photons, yes, but I it agree. could as well be you know the the IR torus. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, yes. Um, and the other thing is, I mean, the way to test this is to wait for the jet to become very low, and then do spectroscopy to see if you can deep spectroscopy to see if you can line if if you can see lines. Well, the thing about this source is that they have tried like the source, the optical magnitude of the source was around 18 
or 18 point something and still they didn't see any 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 signature of uh, accretion disk host galaxy or any any mission line in this source so and the um, yeah, it's not a question of not being patient. And if you remember, I showed on Tuesday in my talk that uh, there are like around 60% VLF objects where we don't have uh, uh, a, a measurement of redshift. We just have upper or lower limits. Uh, yeah, so it's not a question of just not having looked enough. People have looked so for the emission lines in these VLFs very, very hard. So it's not a question of just waiting until it goes down. Yeah, so, so, so but, uh, okay, we should, we should discuss. Um, there was one comment on your, your double power law. Um, have you tried fitting with a, a power law and an exponential? Because Can, can you speak with... Uh, could, have you tried fitting the spectrum instead of a double power law, a power law and an exponential? Um, sometimes fits a bit better. At least well, if you, if you only consider the high energy spectrum, or yeah. you are trying to model the whole SCD? Well, either. I mean... I mean, of course, I, as I mentioned, that um, you, you could go... I mean, you could go for a complicated model, not complicated like a second order model. Here I showed the results only with single, single John SSC model. So you could of course use uh, like two, SS, two John SSC or you can combine with the um, exponential model. But the point I was trying to make, uh, my focus was not on modeling the SCD. My focus was that I have three different results in, uh, using three different kind of study. And then they all, they have all, all of these results has one thing in common was that like their results or the features which I see was more or less similar between VLF objects and FSR2. So that was the point I was trying to make in my yeah, presentation. I understand. Um, I wanted to agree with you on that. No, no, no. I, I, I understand now. Um, so I, I agree with you that the um, a lot of the BLX, when I've been modeling the population, a lot of the BLX, some of them look like they're FSR or QJets. I mean, the, the properties are pretty much indistinguishable. Uh, can I say something? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, actually, in the Mojave sample, uh, majority of the BLX are actually like uh, quasars in terms of, I mean, several properties, including beta parent and even FR2 powers and FR2 morphology. I mean, uh, majority of the BLX in the Mojave sample actually have hotspots and they have FR2 like, Yeah, actually, powers. what I find quite remarkable is that if you look at uh, the parsec scale apparent speeds and if you compare between uh, BLX and FSRQs, I find that uh, probably maybe Talviki can comment on that. I may be wrong, but I believe that uh, on parsec scales, BLX shows faster motion compared to FSRQs. No, is the yeah. slower? Yeah, yeah, yeah they're slow. I think on average, BLX have slower jet speeds than quasars. But given a BLX object, you cannot uh, decide uh, based on the speed. It's a very continuum continuum distribution in beta parents. Um, to answer your question, yes. Um, okay. <laughs> this, this is not. This isn't actually a, um, a, 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 a new suggestion. It, um, it turns out um, that the idea that a subclass of BLAC objects are incredibly beamed quasars and the, the lines are there, it's just you can't see them, is is I think fairly well covered in the literature. I, I mean, I was just looking at a paper by um, Gabriele Gisellini in 2011, which makes precisely that that suggestion. Um, motivated by the spectral energy distributions, in yeah. fact, in his case. Um, and I think it's highly plausible, and I think it's exactly what we were talking about yesterday, the, 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 the low excitation, high excitation division, um, and what we should be doing instead of dividing these numbers, we're dividing, the, um, um, dividing by the continuum and looking at the equivalent width, which is the classical BLAC definition, we should be looking at the luminosity separately. We should be, you know, you should classify what 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 makes physical sense is is the the line luminosity as a proxy for the accretion disk luminosity, um, and in some cases you just can't do that because of observational restrictions. And I think that's why the BLX sample has got polluted with with things that are really quasars. So I think I think this is all converging on a on a sensible picture. Okay. One more question. Um, so another way to look at this scenario is. Um, could we just then focus on actually the speed of the jet itself and then say that when it is high enough, that is when the environment would become important and then, you know, EC will play a role versus when it is low enough and then you're just satisfied with synchrotron plus SSC. Uh, so you, you, we may not have to have a priority information on the environment, but, you know, if the jet is fast enough, then 
EC would become important automatically. Is that for, for the population study, I think I'm not the right person to comment on that, but for individual object, this is what I can say. First of all, the component speed, uh, you don't see, uh, I mean, for each component, you don't see 40 C because the speeds vary between 15 and 40. This is one thing. Second thing is that uh, not all the components have uh, like uh, moves with constant speed. Uh, we have also seen like uh, components, uh, uh, initially they move with slower speed and then they get accelerated. Uh, so that's uh, again a matter of debate. Like it's, uh, I mean, it's, uh, the acceleration is intrinsic to the source or it's just because of the beaming. Um, so this is all I can, I can, I can say. Okay. Uh, there is one question. Yeah, we'll, uh, uh, sounds like something for discussion. There. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah.